Welcome back guys to the Hypertrophy series and firstly I just want to thank you all uh, for the feedback and the awesome response that we've had on previous videos uh, related to this series and today we're going to be talking about the upper body, give you guys a basic overview of the anatomy and functions of each muscle group that comprise the upper body, so the chest, the back, the deltoids and the arms. And we're going to look at exercises that will allow you to maximize growth of each muscle group. We're going to categorize them again into priority one, two, and three in order of their importance uh, relating to hypertrophy as well as their highest force producing uh, actions uh, at that muscle group. We're going to be talking about some applications uh, in program design, so frequency, loading zones, and repetition ranges. And I'm going to give you guys some key tips for training each muscle group effectively. So first up, we have the chest. Anatomy of the chest uh, is pretty simple. It's got two heads, the sternal head and the clavicular head. So the sternal being the uh, lower chest and the clavicular head being the upper chest. Now we can't isolate any particular uh, portion of the chest. However, there are some movements that will train uh, certain fibers more so uh, than others. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. But the functions of the sternal head uh, that at the shoulder it's responsible for transverse flexion uh, and adduction, so think of your bench press, uh, internal rotation and adduction, and shoulder extension. At the scapula, it's responsible for downward rotation, depression, and adduction. And the functions of the clavicular head are very much the same, uh, as well as shoulder flexion and abduction. So, priority one exercises for the chest, multi-joint movements, barbell bench press, dumbbell bench press. Uh, EMG data even suggests that dumbbells involve less triceps uh, than barbells, which could be very useful in terms of the exercises we select uh, for chest hypertrophy. Incline barbell bench press and incline dumbbell bench press. Now an important note uh, in training the chest, uh, the more of an incline we do have, the more of those upper fibers, uh, the clavicular head, we will train. So if you're performing a flat bench press, you're gonna be training the whole chest, predominantly more uh, sternal, fibers, whereas if we have an incline at a 30 degree, 45 degree, we work up the chest and we start to get a little bit more uh, upper pec recruitment, uh, so really important to keep that in mind when you're selecting these exercises. Typically, I like to have one uh, incline variation with one flat variation within a program uh, because this allows us to train both, both heads pretty evenly. Now, when it comes to those priority two exercises, these are your cable chest flies, your pec decks, all of those uh, movements that are responsible for uh, adduction. Now, these movements, whilst priority two, they could be a priority one movement uh, if you're somebody who is needing to prioritize your chest development or you're looking to specialize uh, and build your chest. Uh, but they're priority two movements simply from because you can get a lot of uh, tension stimulus out of those big barbell movements and dumbbell movements and these isolation exercises are going to produce less tension stimulus, uh, simply complementing uh, the movements that we spoke about earlier. Priority three exercises are your dips. Now the reason they're priority three exercises is a lot of people do have trouble uh, getting into position, performing this movement properly without uh, getting any shoulder impingement. So they're not necessarily a bad movement, just for some people they have a really hard time performing it properly, which is why they're a priority three. In terms of program design, Frequency for the chest, anywhere from two to four times a week. Beginners might need to practice and train their chest a little more frequently so they become proficient at the, the barbell movements, whereas advanced athletes, they're able to ingrain those patterns. They're going to produce more force, create more disruption. They might have uh, longer recovery curves uh, and may need to train towards the lower end of that spectrum twice, three times a week. But again, anywhere within that range is a good starting point. Volume for the chest. Starting with 10 to 20 sets, uh, split across the appropriate frequency for you, uh, picking one to two priority one movements, and then again, one P2 movement, and if you're going to incorporate dips, uh, simply add that in as your final movement, so three to four movements uh, total per mesocycle, and just remember that with variation uh, comes the trade-off for specificity, so if you want to get really good at the bench press and you need to work on your technique there, you might need to bench press more frequently, uh, whereas if you're pretty advanced, you might be able to have a higher degree of variation within a single mesocycle. Loading zones and rep ranges for the chest, common sense should dictate here, five to 10 reps for those multi-joint movements, so your bench press, 
uh, your incline barbell presses. You can go higher, you can go lower. There's no uh, need to stay within that rep range specifically, but this is what I would recommend uh, based on the research, my experience uh, for training the chest uh, and working within 10 to 20 reps on those single joint priority two, uh, priority three movements. Again, heavy dips may not necessarily be a good idea for someone who uh, has beat up shoulders, you're performing a lot of heavy bench work, you might need to go lighter and work within some high repetition ranges there. So some training tips for the chest, use a full range of motion if you can. So training through a stretch position uh, is a really good idea for the chest because they do, the pecs will respond very well uh, to that load through a big stretch at the bottom of your bench press, uh, flies, all the rest of it. Uh, but just consider your shoulder mobility, your scapula and thoracic control, and your strength and control in that range. So a lot of people uh, do have you know, certain issues and abnormalities at the shoulder, which cause them to really struggle uh, to get full range of motion without any impingement, pain, or discomfort. Uh, and this usually comes from a lack of thoracic extension. So thoracic uh, is the middle of your back, essentially. Uh, you need to be able to extend your thoracic spine, retract and depress, so rolling your shoulders back and down uh, and getting those scapula nice and tight for those pressing variations. Uh, considerations with the bench press, uh, range of motion. If you're looking to build your chest, you probably don't want to go too wide with your hand position. Uh, this is going to create a really efficient and strong bench press, which we would see typically with a lot of powerlifters. But again, with that comes a decrease uh, in range of motion, which just means more volume because you know that volume is a function of the number of reps, sets, load we perform, but also the distance that uh, we travel through that repetition. So just bear that in mind and also consider uh, you know, how close your hands are. If you're going too close, you're going to get significantly more tricep involvement. So somewhere in the middle is usually a good starting point so that we can get that nice range of motion and we're going to make sure that plenty of stimulus is on the chest. Uh, again, like all barbell movements, there is a skill component uh, to these movements. So make sure that you're working on your technique so that you can use a sufficient stimulus uh, over time. Uh, so practice, practice, practice. And when you are practicing and you can't use uh, you know, significant loads or volumes because you're working on your technique, potentially getting more volume, tension, load uh, through those lower skill movements uh, such as your cable flies, your pec deck, things like this. Quick tip, if you can't feel your chest, activate it. So simply performing some prayer push downs like this, you were seeing plenty of bodybuilders do that and squeezing your chest uh, could be really useful before you perform uh, your bench press variations. Not that you need to feel your chest when you're benching, uh, but sometimes it's a good proxy uh, that the stimulus is going to the target muscle group if you can feel your chest doing something. Um, but again, now we're going to talk about the back, which is comprised of the lats, the traps, and the rhomboids. So starting with the boring, the basic anatomy of the lats, responsible for shoulder, adduction, extension, internal rotation, and transverse extension. For all you exercise science nerds out there, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you don't, uh, check out exrx.net. Uh, They've got plenty of good info on there. And then also uh, the lats are involved at the scapula for depression and downward rotation as well as adduction. So the lats are strong shoulder adductors when the shoulder is externally rotated and it's a strong shoulder extensor when uh, it's in a neutral position. So this is very important in terms of our hand positions uh, when performing certain movements and we'll get into that in a second. So now onto the rhomboids. The rhomboids perform a couple of things. Adduction and downward rotation uh, of the scapula and then the traps got three sections of the traps, the middle, the upper, and the lower. So the middle is responsible for reduction, uh, elevation, and upward rotation, uh, whereas the upper uh, portion of the traps is responsible for scapular elevation and your cervical spine extension, so this movement here. And the lower traps are responsible for scapular upper rotation, adduction, and depression, and thoracic spine extension. So a lot, lot's happening uh, at the traps. but. More importantly for you guys, in a practical sense, what does this mean? What exercises should we choose and why? So, again, starting with our multi-joint movements, priority one exercises, break that down into two components. We have a horizontal row and a vertical pull. And this will just maximize uh, your back development because these are primary functions 
of the upper back and it's going to train pretty much all of those muscles uh, within the back uh, with a few caveats to that. So your horizontal row movements, break them down into supported where you're prone, you have your chest supported on a bench such as a prone dumbbell row, prone barbell row uh, or a seal row or unsupported such as a cable row, uh, a barbell row or a penlay row. So depending on your level of advancement, uh, your mobility, stability, and how well you can hold those positions with certain loads is very important. However, for most beginners, uh, when you're starting out, always start with supported movements uh, or machine variations so that you can uh, target your back whilst you're working on your mobility, stability, and coordination in the gym. And with these supported movements, you will get a lot more quote unquote isolation of the back because you're not going to have uh, other muscles involved anywhere near as much as you would if you're performing uh, an unsupported rowing variation such as a barbell row. But again, progression uh, for these would be to start with a seated cable row, move to a prone dumbbell row, prone barbell row, seal row, bent over barbell row, uh, into a penlay row, so on and so forth. But do consider your technique here. We'll get to that more in a second. And then we have our vertical pulling movements. And quite simply, you've got a pull up, so it could be body weight, uh, assisted with a machine or a band, and then weighted or pull downs. Your priority two exercises, uh, stiff arm pull down, so function of the lat is to again extend the shoulder. Um, and the pull downs are a very good movement to target this function. Uh, and then I've categorized single arm rowing variations uh, or pulling variations into priority two, simply from a time efficiency standpoint, uh, as well as with those bilateral movements, uh, we can get more uh, training stimulus in a quicker time uh, when compared to performing those unilateral single arm movements. So you can perform your single arm rows uh, with cables or dumbbells, uh, or you could perform uh, pull downs with a single hand. Again, uh, most people are pressed for time, so I do recommend uh, the priority one movements, which are those bilateral movements, and those uh, P2 uh, with your single arm variations, uh, if you're somebody who has more time or potentially struggling to feel your lats, and again, we'll get into that in a second. Uh, and a final priority two exercise are your lat pull-ins. So frequency for the back is two to four times a week. Again, beginners will be able to train at the higher end of that simply because they need to master the skill and they're not going to be causing too much fatigue, whereas when you become a little bit more advanced, you want to work down uh, that range <clears throat> potentially two to three times a week. Um, but do consider that the back uh, seems to recover the upper back pretty quickly, uh, depending on the type of movements that you're performing. Uh, volume for the back, again, 10 to 20 sets. Uh, per week and one to two uh, priority one movements from your horizontal row category and one to two movements from your vertical pull category uh, with an optional P2 depending on your level of advancement, your time availability for training uh, and things like this. Loading zone and rep ranges for the back. The back does seem to respond pretty well to a combination of both heavy and light training. So five to 12 reps for your priority one movements, uh, the bilateral work always lends itself uh, better to heavier loading zones uh, when compared to unilateral work um, and 12 to 20 reps for those uh, P2 unilateral uh, exercises but there's no reason why you can't uh, train your rows uh, for more than 12 reps but 5 to 12 reps uh, is just a good uh, starting point and do consider the, the free weight exercises uh, will place more demands on other muscle groups. Uh, so if you're performing bent over barbell rows, uh, you're gonna be recruiting your erectors, all of those muscles, and that's gonna cause some fatigue, which could carry over into your following day if you're training legs, got deadlift session, and that could be problematic. So do consider this when you're selecting these exercises and you're programming for yourself. Um, but more importantly, the tension curve with uh, these rowing and pulling variations are such that the tension curve becomes hardest when you get closer to the midline of your body. So for example, if you're performing a row, when your arms are extended out in front, it's gonna feel pretty easy. You can perform that rep, no worries whatsoever. But as you come closer to your chest, uh, the joint angle closes and the movement becomes significantly harder. What this means in practice is, 
Don't select weights based on how easy it feels through that top portion of the rep, but more so how hard it is through the final stages of the rep where the back is working the hardest. If you're selecting loads and you simply can't retract to press your scapula uh, when the cable's getting close to, or the dumbbell or the barbell, uh, then you're inappropriately choosing weights. And that's not going to place a significant amount of tension uh, on your back which again is going to limit your gains. So you need to make sure you're selecting weights that you can train through a full range of motion, even when the tension curve gets harder uh, as you come towards your midline. Uh, so do keep that in mind. Same goes for your vertical pulling exercises. Final tip when you're training your back, do consider different hand positions and what they mean. So we have pronated, which is palms down, supinated, palms up, and a neutral grip. So with your pull downs, uh, EMG studies have shown that a uh, pronated grip with mid uh, hand position, not too wide, not too narrow, uh, recruits the lats the most. Um, and when we're performing a supinated grip, we will get significantly more bicep involvement. So again, horses for courses, you just need to think about what you're trying to get out of this movement. And again, with the neutral hand position, uh, for most people, this actually allows them to retract and depress their scapula most effectively. So starting with a neutral hand position, then potentially to a supinated position, and then a pronated uh, grip is a useful progression that I use with a lot of my clients uh, to great effect. So again, make sure that you're thinking about this when you're selecting your hand positions for your rowing variations. Moving on to the delts. So the delts have a number of heads. Uh, we'll start with the anterior deltoid, so at the front of the shoulder, and the anterior deltoid is responsible for abduction, flexion of the shoulder, transverse flexion, and then internal rotation, so this here. And it gets a lot of indirect stimulus via the chest, uh, and when you're performing those uh, pressing movements uh, from your chest training, uh, so it is important to consider this. Uh, you may not need to train your anterior delt uh, directly because of that. You've got the lateral delt, which is responsible for abduction, so taking your arms away from your body, flexion uh, of the shoulder, so above your head, and then transverse abduction, and the posterior deltoid, uh, which is at the back of your shoulder, the one that's responsible for that peaked uh, deltoid and that, that capped look, and the posterior delt is responsible for shoulder extension, transverse extension, transverse abduction, and external rotation. So a number of functions are happening at the rear delt, and the priority one movements for your shoulders are your lateral raises. So all of your raises, whether it's dumbbell, uh, kettlebell, cable, uh, all very, very important uh, because the lateral and the posterior delt are the ones we're gonna predominantly be focusing on because like I said, the anterior delt gets plenty of tension when we're doing our pressing movements, uh, so we don't need to train it too much uh, directly. So lateral raises. Secondly, your rear delt flies. Uh, whether it's with a cable, reverse pec deck, or dumbbells, and then face pulls, one of my favorite movements uh, for both the lateral and the rear deltoid. Your priority two exercises here are your anterior delt uh, movements, such as an overhead press, whether it's with a dumbbell, a barbell, or a Z press, I'll do a video on that one shortly, uh, an Arnold press, an upright row, whether it's with a cable, uh, dumbbell, or barbell, just consider with your upright rows, uh, the risk for shoulder impingement increases when we go uh, beyond 90 degrees, so the humerus comes up past uh, parallel uh, to the floor. And in terms of program design or the delts, frequency, two to five times a week. It's a small muscle group. We can train it more frequently, and we can use uh, more volume spread across greater frequencies. So 15 to 25 sets of direct training for the lateral and posterior deltoid. Um, just be mindful of uh, how much pushing volume you have, uh, selecting two to three priority one movements um, and one to two uh, priority two movements. So your loading zones uh, and rep ranges for the delts, typically more type one dominant, so they produce less force, respond really well to higher rep work and metabolite type training. So it's really effective to incorporate uh, higher rep ranges and also some other strategies such as supersets and giant sets. Uh, so 10 to 30 reps for your P1 movements, and then for those P2 exercises, which are compound in nature, 8 to 15 reps. But do consider some joint issues uh, when you're performing. Uh, a lot of side delts and posterior delt work, uh, overuse uh, injuries and issues arise 
if you're performing the same exercises uh, really, really frequently. So do consider having a little bit more variation uh, with your shoulder work. But And again, it's, it's a low skill movement. It's not too hard to master a side raise. Um, so you shouldn't have too many issues learning how to do that, putting some weight on there and going at it. So in terms of training the delts, again, Length tension curves vary depending on the type of exercise we perform. So a lot of people will perform only side raises and they'll usually start at the hip uh, or below the hip, so touching the dumbbells together and then they'll swing up uh, to the side when in fact the lateral delt really only starts to be involved in a side raise from 30 degrees up until parallel to the floor. So if you're using a dumbbell or a kettlebell and you want to internally rotate your shoulder because this is where uh, the lateral delt will be recruited the most, and then raise through the scapular plane, uh, making sure that we work predominantly through that 30 to 90 range. So no swinging, uh, because essentially you're going to take out all the tension on the lateral delt, and it's going to mean a very ineffective uh, stimulus. So we will train through a shortened position, uh, so it's going to look like you're cheating the rep, performing half reps, but this is just an effective uh, range of motion for the delts. Conversely, your cable uh, side raises, where we perform them uh, leaning from the pulley system, uh, these will train the lateral delt in a stretch position, which is something we miss out on when we use free weights. So for complete lateral delt development, I do recommend using both dumbbells and a cable raise so that we can train uh, through both a lengthened and shortened position, because we know that training through a stretch position is really important for hypertrophy. Plenty of uh, options and variety available to you guys when it comes to your delts because uh, we do have a lot of exercises, greater frequency and volume, so you can pick and choose which exercises feel best for you, but do consider length tension curves, proper technique, just as you would any other movement. Finally, onto the arms. So the anatomy of the arms comprise of two muscle groups. The biceps, the triceps. So the biceps actually have three functions which people often forget about. So flexion of the elbow is the obvious one, but it's also responsible for supination of your forearm and then shoulder flexion, so actually raising your arm up. And the triceps are simply responsible for extension of the elbow. So for the biceps, your priority one movements, dumbbell curls, barbell curls, cable curls, all of your curling variations. And for your triceps, uh, your priority one movements are tricep pushdowns uh, in shoulder extension, so when we have your shoulders down, and then training uh, through shoulder flexion also when our hands are over our head because the long head of the tricep uh, is involved more when we get our arms up above our head uh, than when we're in shoulder extension. So you want to be training through both shoulder extension and through shoulder flexion. Uh, your arms can be trained pretty frequently because they are a small muscle group. So two to five times per week uh, and volume recommendations for the arms. I preferably use high volumes for the arms. I've seen a lot of great results personally and with my clients and athletes. So 15 to 25 sets per week of direct arm work uh, split across three to five uh, sessions and your loading zone and rep ranges, the arms will respond pretty well to a broad spectrum of rep ranges. So anywhere from eight to 25 reps, very useful in uh, training your arms. And some training tips for the arms. With your bicep training, make sure that you're incorporating some curling work when you're in shoulder extension, so an incline dumbbell curl, because this will train the long head of the bicep a little bit more than the shorter head, and then also getting some uh, curling with shoulder uh, flexion in there, so whether you're curling and then raising your arms slightly, or you're doing some high cable curls, this is very important uh, if you want to maximize your bicep development. And again, just making sure that we are you know, programming uh, for completeness. And something I always teach my clients and athletes to focus on with their arm training is the mind-muscle connection. So very small muscle group, we should be able to feel it, especially because we're training with higher reps, we're going to be getting more uh, metabolite buildup in the muscle. We should be able to feel uh, quite a bit of swelling, uh, soreness in the biceps, triceps, if we're putting the tension on uh, those muscles correctly. Uh, again, timeless form is critical for your arm training, so no swinging. Uh, make sure that you get tight, creating what's called irritation, so full body tension, uh, so that you can uh, produce more force through those muscle groups and ensure the stimulus is going there. There's no cheating, no swinging, uh, or no you know cranking out reps uh, for the sake of it. That is uh, the wrap for arm hypertrophy and this video. I hope it was useful. I hope you guys found it informative. Uh, if you did like the video, 
comment below. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask, subscribe to the channel, and I'll speak to you all next time.